Well, it's Thursday night, and I'm going to be teaching you tonight on a topic called Jesus came to set women free to be all that they were created to be. It is a let's chat um, session tonight because unfortunately I couldn't do it yesterday. And it's the answer to a question. And the question was this. What is the stand that the Bible has about women in ministry? And what does it mean to have a covering over our heads as discussed in 1 Corinthians 11? So that was a lovely, juicy topic for me to have to, to speak about. It's not one I might have chosen to speak about because I always feel that if, if you want to understand the freedom and the liberation that God has done for women, it's really good for a man to teach it. But anyway, I'm going to be discussing this tonight and I'm trusting for just such breakthrough, such revelation and such excitement as we look at this beautiful topic. And I do believe it's a beautiful topic because Jesus came to destroy the works of the evil one. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for the privilege to be able to minister tonight. I want to thank you for the privilege of being able to share with your beautiful people the truth, the word of God, the gospel of God, and the unpacking of the teaching of the Holy Spirit. And I pray for such revelation. I pray for such freedom. I pray for such liberty. I pray for such clarity. I pray for such anointing. And I always ask Jesus that it's your word that will be remembered, Holy Spirit, not mine. And I pray that people that have had shackles on and people that have had mindsets that have been confused will be liberated tonight as they listen to this teaching. And I thank you for the privilege of being able to share it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Well, friends, it's wonderful to share this with you tonight. And I'm going to start by just looking at the very beginning, and that is Genesis 1, verse 27 and 28, and that talks about the very creation and how Jesus created man and a woman. And we know that we were all made in the image and likeness of God the Father, and just like the Trinity, the three and one, have three different parts to play, but all of them are equally important. There's no inferior God and a superior God, and yet God is the head. Jesus is the heart of the Trinity because he's the one that came and presented himself to the world. He touched people. He loved on people. He brought the heart of God to the people. And the Holy Spirit is the hope for the next generation because Jesus said, I've got to go. My spirit will stay behind so that they can continue teaching you, leading you, comforting you, showing you everything that I've taught. And then Jesus taught everything that he saw the Father do. So it's that incredible unity. And that oneness, and that no one is superior, no one is inferior, but they have different roles to play. And that was the image and likeness that God made man and woman in. And you know, when God created man, Adam, he put woman and the next generation inside of him. And then he took woman out of his side. And when he created woman, the two together already had the seed for the next generation to come through. It was all already created in Adam. Adam was one, and then he was separated to become three in one. Adam, Eve, and then bringing forth of the seed for the next generation. And so we see that beautiful image of being made in the image and likeness of God. So it says in Genesis 1 verse 27 and 28, God created mankind or man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, which means conquer it. So man and woman together were called to conquer the earth. And then it said, and rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, in other words, all of creation. And so there was a dominating and a reigning over creation. Who was meant to subdue it? Both men and women. Who was meant to conquer it? Both men and women. Who was meant to rule? Together they were created to rule. So we have to understand that. And then we know with the fall that the curse came in. And what was the curse on women? Well, the curse on men was by their own sweat and brow, they would have to toil the soil and that there were going to be thorns. In other words, they would have to work hard by their own sweat to be able to get in what they needed to get in to provide for their family. For the woman, he said this, Genesis 3 verse 15 to 16, 
I place hostility, hostility between you and the snake, the serpent, the enemy, and the woman. So he was talking to the to the serpent and he said, I place hostility or enmity or war between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He will bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. Now we know that's talking about Jesus that will ultimately destroy the works of the evil one. And then he said to the woman, I'll greatly increase your pain and your conception. In pain, you will bring forth children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will dominate you. So the curse is the fact that there was a curse on the childbearing. That's why so many women battle to fall pregnant. That's why there's such pain in childbearing. And friends, remember that's part of the curse. And then he says you will desire, you will long for, you will desperately want a husband. And he will dominate you. He will control you. He will rule you. He will pos have possession over you. Now that was the curse. A husband will dominate his wife. But the enemy came in and warped that even more by changing that, that men would dominate women. And from that second onwards, women became second-rate citizens. They became second-rate citizens. And they became the possession of man because Satan hates women. He hates everything about her. And that's why so many women battle with a low self-image because they have this voice coming against them all the time, telling them they're useless, they're hopeless, they're never going to amount to much, they're not good enough. And women battle with the self-image all the time because of the war between her and the enemy. So from that moment onwards, it just wasn't just a husband would dominate his wife, but it was that men would dominate women. That's never what the curse said. But the enemy took it to another level. But the good news, friends, is this, that Jesus Christ came to break the curse. He came to break the curse of doing it in our own strength. For men, he came to break the curse of battling and, ch and bearing children. And I want to say to you, ladies, you have to know the curse has been broken. When we come before the Father and we understand the Redeemer and what he's redeemed us of, you know that you have the liberty and the freedom to fall pregnant and to have children and the curse is broken. And you've got to remind the, the enemy you're not under that curse anymore. And it says in Galatians 3 verse 13, Christ has redeemed us, which means he's paid the price. From the curse of the law, that word law is nomos, it's not Torah. Anything that's been established or any law whatsoever. So the word nomos means any law that, that put anyone under the curse has been broken. If it was the Torah, it would mean only that which, which was since the days of Moses. But this is from the beginning of time, friends. And you know, it's very interesting because between Malachi and Matthew, I read somewhere that there were another 600 laws that were added in that time by the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the leaders of the churches. 400 of them pertain to keeping women in a second graded position. So it was absolutely evil and it was never God. But when Jesus died, when he redeemed us, he redeemed us of the curse of the law. Any law that had ever been written, putting women in the place of being second grade and stopping them from being next to their husbands to be able to rule and to be able to conquer the way that they were established, created to do. They were told to work as a team the way Father, Son and Holy Spirit work. So it says Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it was written, cursed is everyone that hangs on the cross. So Jesus took that curse upon himself and he broke the curse and he set women free. Now in those days, when Jesus came, women were not allowed to walk next to a man. If the man was walking, his wife had to walk behind him. She was his property. She was his possession. A man was never allowed to look at a woman, especially not a single woman, or talk to her because she was second grade. He was superior to her. That was an unaccepted norm, and that never happened. So women never walked next to men, and they ne they were never interacted with men or, or had a man look at them in the eye. That was not acceptable. The other thing, too, that is really important to know is that women were not educated. They were not trained and educated in the Torah, the Word of God, the law of the time, because men were. Men learned it off by heart. In those days, men could quote the Torah off by heart because they were all equipped at different 
different ages with different levels of, of studies and different levels of writings. But the women were not allowed to be there. They were not allowed to be trained in that presence. Um, and so we know that there was such a discrepancy and a distinction between men and women. Women were not even counted in a group. When they counted the group, they only counted men. Women did not even consider to be a number when it came to counting in a group. That's what Jesus came into. And friends, it's just absolutely amazing to see how Jesus came and deliberately shattered that culture. Now, I'm going to give you some examples of what Jesus did. And I'm sure there are more, but I haven't been able to dig deeper and find some more. I'm just going to give you a few, just to give you a taste of what Jesus did. So... When it came to announcing the arrival of Jesus, the angel didn't go to the Pharisees and didn't go to the Sadducees and didn't go to the high priest and say that the Messiah is about to be born. He went to a young woman called Mary and a woman who was not even allowed to read the Torah was the first to know that the Messiah was going to be born. We see in Luke 1 verse 30, that's when Gabriel came to Mary and said that you've been chosen to carry the son. And then he went to Joseph in a dream and he went to the shepherds and he went to the Magi. At no point of time did the learned men of that day know that Jesus was about to arrive. The announcement was made to a woman first. The next thing that we see that when he was eight days old and he was taken to the temple to be dedicated, it was Anna, a prophetess, who'd been living in the temple that was the first one to prophesy over Jesus. And we read about that in Luke 2, verse 36 to 38. She was the one that announced that the Messiah had come, that Jesus had come and prophesied over his life. This woman that had set herself apart and lived in the temple from the day that her husband died, I think she was only married about seven years, and she had set herself apart, and she, she was 84 years old when Jesus came, and she prophesied over Jesus. That's the second woman that was elevated in the birth and in the life of Jesus Christ. The next thing is that we see that Jesus spoke to women. He wasn't allowed to. He wasn't even allowed to look at them. And yet he spoke to them. He communicated with them. He, he had conversations with them. We know the, the, the woman that came and asked him for the crumbs under the table. We know that the woman at the well, that Jesus spoke to her. And he didn't only speak to her, but he had a conversation with her. He prophesied over her. He brought the revelation of worship to her. He equipped her. He trained her. And she ended up becoming the, the, the evangelist to Samaria. Now, remember, Jesus came for the Jews. This was a Samaritan woman, and yet Jesus spoke to her, and he, he prophesied over her, and he brought the message of the gospel to her. And even much more, he spoke about the fact that Father was coming back for worshipers, those who worship him in spirit and truth. He gave her deep truths about the next season in God. And we can read about that in John 4, verse 9, that Jesus spoke to her, spent time with her. The disciples were shocked. They couldn't believe he would do this. And then in John 4, verse 28, it says that she went and evangelized everywhere she went and told everybody about Jesus. The next thing we see that Jesus did was that he taught women sitting at his feet. Now, friends, we have to understand that this was not allowed. When a rabbi used to travel around, he would put his, his disciples, those that he was training, they would sit at his feet, they would sit in front of him, and he would teach them, and he would equip them, and he would train them. But Jesus allowed women to take that place. Now, that was another shocking thing for the disciples to understand, and it was shocking for Martha. Remember, Mary was Martha's sister, and it says in Luke 10, verse 39 and 42, when Martha saying, don't allow her to sit there. Tell her to come and do the woman's work. Remember, woman served, woman brought the food, woman cleaned up, and the men sat, and the men learned, and the men were equipped, and women weren't allowed to be there. And Jesus said this in Luke 10, verse 39 and 42. One thing is needed, required, or is necessary, and Mary has chosen what is better. And it will not be taken away from her. What did he mean, friends? He meant that he's breaking a pattern. 
And what was needed was not for Martha to keep doing the woman's job, the, the scene as woman's job in the kitchen, but for Martha to come and sit at his feet and to become equipped and to become trained and to take her rightful place as a child of God, the way that God intended for them to be. And he said, this will not be taken away from her. You see, many people interpret that as as Martha being um, busy and, and serving and Mary basically being lackadaisical and just sitting at Jesus' feet almost as if she was shirking her responsibilities when actually Jesus was trying to make a point. Martha, you're doing what is an old pattern. There's a new thing that's needed and you need to understand. I need the woman to sit at my feet and to be equipped just as the men are being equipped. The next thing that we see and this is that Jesus allowed women to support him financially. And that was another thing that was strange because men were meant to be the ones that were the supporters. And here Jesus allowed the women out of their own resources. And that is in Luke 8, verse 1b to 3. The 12 were with him. So that's the 12 disciples and certain women. There was Mary called Magdalene, and we know that that is the woman that had seven demons cast out of her. And from the moment she got set free, she used to follow Jesus wherever she went. There was Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward. Now, Herod was the king, and this man worked in the, in the offices, in the, in the position of Herod. He was an officer in Herod's courts. And, um, and his wife, who was a Roman woman, was serving Jesus. And Susanna... And many others which ministered with unto him and provided for him out of their own personal resources. And so here we see the 12 are with him, but there are also Mary Magdalene, there's also Joanna, there's also Susanna, and we know that Mary's mother was there, and there were other women. So when he was equipping and training the 12 disciples, he was equipping and training these women at the same time. And what's more, he was allowing them to pay the costs and the things that he needed for them to pay for his trips and for his ministry. And so it was absolutely a no-go area and Jesus was allowing it to happen. The next thing we see is in Matthew 9 verse 20. And this is talking about the woman with the issue of blood. Now, according to the Jewish law, if anybody was bleeding, having their period, they were not allowed to come into public. They had to stay at home. They were considered to be defiled. And here this woman had been bleeding for 12 years. And not only did she come into public, they were not allowed to come near a man. They were not allowed to touch a man because they were defiled. Not only did she come into the public places, but she touched him. And you know what, friends? Under the, under the law of the time, he had the right to rebuke her, to challenge her, even to embarrass her because she was defiled and she dared touch him. But he didn't do any of that. He said, who touched me? And then he said, by your faith, you've been made whole. Friends, we have to understand that Jesus was incredibly kind. And he was incredibly liberating, especially to women at that time. And then I love this passage of scripture. Every king had to be anointed. The, they, the, the, the priests used to anoint the kings and the priests. We see how Moses was instructed to do that. They had to pour the oil over their head and would run down the beard. And that's how they ordained them to be a priest. And they ordained them to be the king. Now, in Luke 7 verse 46, the Pharisees were upset because the woman took the alabaster jar and broke it. And she poured it over his feet. And in Matthew 26, verse 7, it says, And a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume and poured it over his head while he sat at the table. Why are you bothering this woman? And they came and they moaned at him and they said, How can you allow this? That, that was such a lot of money. How can you allow this? And he said, Why are you bothering this woman? She's done a beautiful thing. In Luke 7, it says, you did not anoint my head, but the woman came and anointed me. Friends, Jesus was anointed king by a woman. A woman came and poured oil over his head. Luke says it was over his feet. Maybe it was two, twice that he was anointed by two different women. Maybe it was the same account. Matthew gave the account of the head and Luke, who told the story afterwards, said it was over the feet. Because a woman wasn't allowed to anoint a man's head. 
But either way we look at it, Jesus said to them, you were the ones that should have anointed me. He was dining with the Pharisees. He said, you, the priests, should have anointed me, but you didn't. A woman anointed me. Friends, I hope you're getting the revelation of how powerful this is, how amazing this is, how beautiful this is, because that's what God has done for us, friends. And then we see the resurrection of Jesus. And I love that. And that's the last example I'm going to be using tonight. And the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus comes out of the cave. The first person that's there is Mary Magdalene. And he presents his resurrected state to Mary. Friends, the same woman that were being taught by him all the time. Tommy he was teaching the 12 and he was teaching the woman. Mary was the first one there. And he said, Mary, it's me, Mary. And she heard his name and she looked up. Remember, she wasn't allowed to look at a person. So she couldn't look at him. So when he came before, she couldn't look at him. And he said, it's me, Mary. And she looked up and she saw him. And he said, go tell the others. So not only did he reveal himself first to a woman, he then gave her the instruction to go and tell about it, friends. How amazing is that? How Jesus broke every single limitation that men had put on women because they were under the curse. He came to break the power of the curse and set women free to be all that they were intended to be. Now remember Joel and Peter prophesied that their time was coming where there would be a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And we know that the Holy Spirit came after Jesus died and then came the great outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And I just want to read it to you from Acts 2 verse 16 to 18 and it was also prophesied in Joel 2. At that, um, but this is what that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel, and it came to pass that in the last days, God said, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your sons and daughters now, they often use the term sons and daughters when they were talking about spiritual sons and spiritual daughters will prophesy. So, whether it was physical or spiritual, it's the same thing. That means to speak forth by divine revelation, under the divine prompting, to teach, to rebuke, to reprove, and to comfort each other. Friends, he said, your sons and daughters, after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, will be teaching, they'll be correcting, they'll be rebuking, they'll be comforting, under the divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they will speak. Speak. And that's what the word prophecy means. The divine inspiration to speak forth the words of God. Your young men will have visions. Your old men will have dreams. And in those days, I will pour out my spirit on my servants. That word servant means, according to Joel, servants in the sense of prophets and Levites, prophets and priests, both men and women, they will prophesy. So Joel said a time is coming where men and women are going to operate under the same giftings. There's not going to be a restriction of what men can do and what women can do. Peter said the time has now come. This is the time that we were speaking about. Paul later, I'm sorry, Paul later writing to the Galatians in Galatians 3 verse 28 said, There's neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, neither male nor nor female, for we are all one in Christ. So friends, when it comes to giftings, when it comes to the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is dis uh, discussed in 1 Corinthians 12 verse 1, when it comes to the fivefold ministry of Jesus, which is discussed in Ephesians 4, when it comes to the character giftings of God, which is discussed in Romans 12 verse 1 to 9, there's absolutely no difference. There is a difference in authority that protects us. And we have to understand authority that protects us. In the house, the husband is the head. That means the one that protects, provides, and promotes. That's the job of a head. It's not a dominator. It's not getting everybody to work for them. It's getting somebody that will lay down their life for their wife to provide for her, to cause her to blossom and the children to blossom, to promote them and to protect them against the forces of darkness, to protect them in the spirit realm. And so it's really important that we understand that. 
And there's the authority of the fivefold. Every gift of the fivefold carries a mantle of authority. So an apostle has an authority that they establish. Power is a gift of the Holy Spirit. Authority is a position of sonship. Prophets walk in authority because they shift and open up the heavens and break things open. Evangelists walk in authority. Teachers walk in authority. Pastors walk in authority. So when it comes to the fivefold ministry, each mantle carries its own authority, friends. We need to understand that. And so you get the head of the home that carries authority. You get the the fivefold ministry that carries authority. You get the elders in the church, which are like the fathers in the church. They carry authority. So authority is very different to gifting. And we have to understand the difference. There's no difference. Remember, Jesus came to break open for the Jew Jews. And Peter and Paul both had the revelations of uh, the revelation of including the Gentiles. And then we see Paul was commissioned to minister to the Gentile church. And so Jesus primarily brought his message and set the Jewish woman free and the men because they also, the curse was broken over them. They don't have to strive to work anymore. They're called to do the works that God has predestined for them to do. But also the woman, that curse is broken. And if you're coming into agreement with it, you're believing a lie, friends, because Jesus broke that curse. And his cross and dying on the cross was more than enough for every single curse to be broken. But then Paul says there's no difference between male, female, or between Jew or Greek. Because remember, before Jesus died, the Jews were the chosen nation. After the resurrection of Christ and the outpouring of the Spirit, it's not about the Jews and the Gentiles. It's about the believers, those who receive them. And so whether you're Jew or whether you're Gentile, you are a believer if you believe in the blood of Jesus Christ. And there is no difference. Friends, the Messianic Jews or the born-again Jews are not more special than the Gentiles. They were the first called, just like Adam was the first created. But God allowed them to be raised up out of that. And now they carry the same anointing. There is no slave or free. It doesn't matter if you're a slave or free because in God there's no difference and there's no male or female. So that's very clear that there was prophetic word about a time coming for women to take their rightful place, that there was a prophetic word about the fact that there's no difference between them. Then what is the big confusion? Well, the confusion came in with two scriptures that Paul wrote. Remember, Paul, who was called to the Gentiles, wrote two scriptures. And in both those scriptures, he wrote them for a very definite reason. Now, the first one was to the church in Corinth. And the second one was written to Timothy, who was in Ephesus. Now, to understand what that was about, we need to understand a little bit more about the city. They were not written to the church in general. They were written to two specific churches for a reason. The first thing that I want you to know is that Corinth was a Greek city. And in the Greek city of Corinth, there was the temple of Aphrodite. That was the main temple, the most important temple. There were also other temples. Um, they were temples to Poseidon, the ruler of the sea, to Apollo, to Hermes, to Venus, to Fortuna Isis. And that was ded the dedication to all gods, those temples that were to the minor ones. But the major one was the temple of Aphrodite. Now, the, 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 the goddess Aphrodite was known as the goddess of love. 2 BC, a man called Strabo, W-R-O-T-T, -T, wrote, wrote this in the research of that time. He said that there were over a thousand women companions in Corinth. In other words, temple prostitutes, women that were dedicated to the temple, that believed in religious worship and sacred sex as part of the cleansing of men. And men used to travel from all over the place, especially the sailors, and they would come and have intimacy with these women, these temple prostitutes, over a thousand of them in that area. And so when Paul went into Corinth, <coughs> to establish the church, this is the harvest that he came into. <coughs> he spoke strongly against sexual immorality in the church in Corinth. In 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9 to 20, and in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 20 and 21, he strongly spoke against the fact 
that sexual immorality was part of the behavior. Excuse me. <coughs> Corinth was a symbol of immorality at that time, and it was known for its life of drunkard, immoral debauchery. Now, these are the people that Paul reached. These are the people that got saved. These are the people that came into the temples. Now, I've been into some temples as I've traveled east. And I want you to understand that the temples of the, of the idols and the pagan temples are nothing like our temples. Number one, they are incredibly noisy. There's big idols and everybody's just doing their own thing. Now, in those, those old temples, and they still do have temple prostitutes today. They're not as blatant. But in those old temples, they were pretty much the same as the modern pagan temples are today. They're noisy, there's clanging bells, everybody's doing their own thing. Nothing is sacred, nothing is religious, there's nothing holy about it. It's incredibly unholy and it's incredibly sexual. People are having a picnic, kids are playing over there, people are praying over here. Everyone's just doing their own thing to the idols and, and crying and weeping and wailing and it's noisy. The other thing is too that the women were considered because they were used they were they were male priests and female priestesses but because they were seized as, as seen to be people that could sanctify you the whole licentious um, seductive sensual vibe that was going on in the temples these women brought that into the church into the temple of the church so now suddenly women were coming in that came from a completely different culture. They were they, they were Greek. They came in from a completely different culture and a different understanding. They brought what they were used to into the temple. Remember, the Jewish men had grown up understanding and knowing the Torah. But the Jewish women hadn't. They weren't taught the scriptures. Jesus opened the way for them to be taught the scriptures. And now these pagans were coming in. And suddenly it was chaos because the Hellenics were embracing the ways of the Greeks and saying, but it's fine. And there was this compromise going on, half Jewish, half Greek, half Christian at the time, and half pagan. And, and there was chaos going on. So there was a pagan worship. There was They were loud. It was chaotic. Everyone was doing their own thing. There was no reverence. There was no order. There was, no, there was definitely nothing that was holy or pure or sacred. It was chaotic. That's what... Paul was addressing with a, a Corinthians church. So he writes the two letters to the Corinthian church to bring order. There was such confusion about the women in the church because of these, the way these women were working. And so there was this absolutely clashing of, of, of cultures. And he was saying, wait, guys, we've got to bring some order into this and do what it is that we need to do to do it God's way. And friends, it's still out there today. We come into the church thinking like the world does, and we've got to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And that's what Paul was doing. So there were incredible amount of problems in the Corinthian church. Number one, they, they were claiming superior, uh, uh, super, spiritual superior, oh, I'm so sorry. Number one, they were claiming spiritual super, superiority over each other. And he was saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, that's not right. That's not the way it's going to happen. They were suing each other in public courts because they were behaving in the Greek way. There was sexual immorality and there was misbehavior. So Paul had to bring correction. And if you read the two books of Corinthians, they are about transforming people from thinking Greek to thinking according to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, it was in that situation that he wrote to the church in Corinthians. Now, I want you to understand that in Ephesians, because he also wrote to the church in Ephesus, in Ephesians 5 verse 21, he says this, he says, submit one to another. Break down the superiority and striving and everybody wanting to be important by submitting one to another. We prefer each other, we submit to each other, we listen to each other, we hear what the other is saying. Then he goes on to say in Ephesians 5 22, wives, submit to your husband. 
And husband, lay down your love for your wife like Jesus laid down his love for the church. Love her. So he's giving them instruction on what godly marriage looks like. Because remember, it was a very, very perverted society. Now the word wife in Ephesians is exactly the same word that he uses in 1 Corinthians 14 and 2, Corinth, 2 Timothy 2. The word husband in Ephesians is the same word that he uses, but in Timothy and in Corinthians, they've used the word man and woman, singular, not men and woman, plural. So we need to know he's addressing husbands and wives. It says in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 33 to 35, for God is not the author of confusion. Why did he say that? Because it was chaotic in the temple when they came together, which means disturbance or, or tumult but of peace. And as in all the churches of the saints, let your wives keep silent. Hold their peace in the church, for it is not permitted for them to speak, but they are commanded under to be obedient, to be subject to the custom. If they learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for a woman to speak. That means to use words to declare her mind or to disclose her thoughts in church. Friends, he wasn't saying a woman cannot bring a word in church. He was saying, while these women are learning the ways of the gospel and the ways of Christianity, don't let them shout out. Don't let them disturb. Husbands, you've already learned the truth. If your wife's got a problem, teach them at home, show them at home. But there was chaos. In many of the synagogues, the women were sitting up on a, on a, on a, um, a higher level than the men. They were sort of looking down at the men. They were on, the, on another floor of the men. And the men would be down there. And they would just shout down to their husband. And they would contradict. And they wouldn't, come, let's go home. The kids are miserable. They would just cross over the teaching and what was happening there. And he was saying, guys, this isn't reverent. This is, not, this is not submitting to each other. This is not honoring the teacher. This is not doing it in God's way. God is not a God of disorder. That's the way the pagan temples work. But it's not the way the temple of God works. So wives, if you've got something you don't understand or you've got a question, go home and ask your husbands about it. They will help you. They will teach you. But don't shout out in church. Be quiet in church. Keep a reverent atmosphere in church. That's what he was referring to. Then we see in um, 1 Timothy, now Timothy was written to the church in Ephesus. What do we know about the church in Ephesus? Well, in Ephesus, there was the temple to um, Diana. Now, Diana was known as the goddess of wild animals, of the moon, of fertility, and of the underworld. And she was the multi-breasted one. And they used to worship her, and she was the stronghold in that area. And there, too, were temple prostitutes. And the Roman women were educated women. They were strong in character and they were active in maintaining family structure and they were active in society. So it was a completely different culture and the women were strong and the women dominated in many cases in the Roman society. Whereas in the Christian society, God was bringing the women out to take their right rightful places and to learn and to be educated. And so these strong women also, many of them involved in sexual immorality, involved in temple prostitution. Um, sexual immorality and sexual behavior was rough. Prostitution was legal. It was nothing, there was nothing wrong with a man sleeping with other women as long as he was married to his wife and he honored his wife and he served, he served his wife in the, in the role of being a husband and protector and provider for her. Um, there were pornographic paintings and art collections in the upper class all over the walls. So children were being brought up with these pornographic paintings, and that was completely normal to them. There was nothing wrong with perversion. It was part of their lifestyle. There was also, it was normal for men to be attracted to teenagers, both men, men and women, and pedestry, pedest, P-E-D-E-R-A-S-T-Y, was condoned. And that was... The attraction, the sexual attraction between young boys and men. There was no such thing as homosexuality or heterosexuality. It was a case of anything goes, be married, have a wife, have children. But in the meantime, if you're attracted to these, that's absolutely fine. It's absolutely fine. And there are paintings all over the place. 
that that made that acceptable from a very young age that that was normal life now paul establishes a church where diana has been the stronghold for for generations and that is why they kicked him out of of um of ephesus because of the fact that because so many people got born again and they were burning all the all the books that they had and everything else and because of that the sales of all the little idols and all the things pertaining to to diana worship was going down and so the craftsmen got rid of him because they said you're interfering with our business it was big business and he had to flee for his life but he left timothy behind now remember timothy's father was a greek so Timothy had also grown up with pagan worship and with all kinds of, of, of sexual um, confusion in his home. But he had a born-again mother, mother and he had a born-again granny. And these two prayed for him and taught him the truths of God. And so now Timothy is left in Ephesus to be the, the leader of the church and to establish the church and to bring through the truth of the gospel. And so he writes to Timothy too. And remember the, the, the letter to the woman is in between a whole lot of other things, talking about changing the way you worship, talking about to, uh, uh, not getting involved with, with sexual immorality, talking about the relationship between a husband and wife, correcting the divisions, the disputes. And Paul goes on to talk about the fact you can't come into the church and do what you did in the pagan church. In the pagan churches, they were feasting. People were completely drunk all the time, and there was such a lot of sexual things happening. And they brought that into the church. And he said, no, 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 that can't happen. Don't feast at the breaking of bread table that some of you get a lot and others don't get any. Don't get drunk as some of you are doing because that's not acceptable. And definitely there cannot be any sexual um, uh, uh, disbehavior going on. And women, you've got to learn how to take the questions that you have and ask your husband and not shout out at the church, cause a disturbance and not have every reverence for those that are teaching. So that was the context of the Corinthians letter. And then he says this to Timothy. Timothy, let a wife, because that word woman actually means wife, let a wife learn with a quiet spirit and submissively. I do not permit a wife to teach or to usurp authority over her husband. She must be quiet. So he's saying, woman, don't shout out and tell your husband he doesn't know what he's talking about. Don't make a nuisance of yourself and behave like you would in the temples. That doesn't happen here. Here, the wife needs to quietly learn, ask the questions, let him teach you, let him equip you, because remember the husbands had been educated, the woman hadn't. Learn quietly. There needs to be order, there needs to be respect. And at the same time, don't usurp and shout out the way the Roman woman usurped in their society. Now, it wasn't about domination or control. It was about understanding that your husband is the head and you've got to respect that and you've got to allow him to do his role because it's to protect you against the forces of darkness. It's to empower you and to provide for you. And if there is something that you disagree on, talk about it at home. Don't bring it into the public place. So that was what the context of those two scriptures were. It was never women and men submit superior inferior women cannot teach it was a wife and her husband and if you look at any research that's done on that passage of scripture when he talks about wives and husbands and that's what it's interpreted in other places like colossians and ephesians it's exactly the same word that is in timothy and 1 corinthians wives and husbands and even in the english bible they have made it as a woman singular and not as woman plural so it cannot apply to woman plural it's a woman a wife and her husband so those are the two scriptures that have caused so much confusion now if paul truly believed that a woman may not teach and a woman may not preach then he would not have carried on and released so many women into so many different aspects of the ministry now i'm going to be talking now about the woman that paul set free remember jesus said jesus set the jewish woman free but paul set the gentile woman free so the first one we see is lydia who was a businesswoman from tyatara and she ran the church in her home and paul and silas used to visit her and minister in her church and that was in Acts 16 verse 14 and verse 40. 
And then we see the letter to the Roman church. And this is when Jesus um, wrote to the Roman church. I mean, where Paul wrote to the Roman church. And remember, he was in Rome and he was a captive in Rome for about two years. So he wrote many letters from Rome. And this is the letter that he wrote in, in chapter 16. And he mentions many women that had been working with him, that were part of the ministry and that had done many things with Paul's ministry. And he told them to greet them and to honor the woman that had been so busy. So in Romans 16, verse 1 and 2, he said, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deaconess. So we know that Phoebe was a deaconess in the church, which is at St. Curio. Welcome her in the Lord, as is appropriate for saints, and provide her with anything she may need from you. For she has assisted many people including me. So he sent um, Phoebe to the church in Romans. She's the one that I believe actually took the letter to them. And he says, welcome her. This woman is amazing. She's done so much for everybody else. Give her everything she needs. Make sure that she is, that she's looked after, that she's got everything she needs because she's an amazing woman in ministry. Then in um, verse three to five, he, he greets Priscilla and Aquila. Now, what's important about Priscilla and Aquila, they're mentioned six times in the New Testament in different books. Corinthians mentions them, Acts mentions them, Romans mentions them. And every time they're mentioned, there's something else about them as a couple that we learn. So initially, Paul introduces them as Aquila and Priscilla. Now, what was common in the writings of the Hebrew books is that when whoever carried the primary gift, the main gift, would be called first. They, they would be named first. So, for example, when Barnabas and Paul went out originally, Acts 15, they said Barnabas and Paul were sent out. But it very soon became apparent that Paul was the primary gift. And from then onwards, Paul was mentioned first. It would be Paul and Barnabas, Paul and Silas, and they would mention Paul first because he was the primary gift. He was the main gift, and the others were there to assist him in unpacking and doing whatever it is that they needed to do. Now, that's exactly what happened with Priscilla and Aquila. Twice, Aquila is mentioned first, and four times, Priscilla is mentioned first. Now, um, they were both tent makers in Acts 18, verse uh, 2, 22, I think it is. It, it tells us that. They traveled much with Paul. So they traveled all over the place with Paul. They assisted him in his ministry. They worked with him all the time. And that's in Acts 18, verse 18. Together they taught Apollo. Now, they heard him teaching. And they heard him uh, ministering the word of God. And they felt like his doctrine wasn't accurate. So they took him in. Priscilla and Aquila took him in. And they trained him. And they equipped him. And they taught him. And he became a mighty apostle um, later on recognized. And Paul said, some say they are Paul and some say they are Apollos. Because of the fact that he was such a mighty, strong, gifted man. But he was taught by Priscilla and Aquila. Then they ran a house church. 1 Corinthians 16 verse 19. And the most important thing is the scholars say they originally thought that Paul wrote Hebrews. But apparently due to the timing of Hebrews, he couldn't have written Hebrews. But the, the, the context of Hebrews was so much like the teachings of Paul. So then later they felt, well, maybe Barnabas or Apollo wrote um, the, the letter of, to the Hebrews. But... Other scholars think it must have been Priscilla because Priscilla taught Apollo and Priscilla spent all her time, her and, and, and Aquila spent all their time traveling with Paul. She taught Apollo and Paul taught Barnabas. So that book is written under the teaching, the same style, the same heart of Paul. But it was one of the three of them that wrote it because Paul couldn't have written it because of where Paul was at the time that that book was written. So scholars aren't sure if it was Priscilla that wrote it, if it was Apollo that wrote it, or if it was Barnabas that wrote it. But they all wrote under the anointing of Paul. Barnabas, direct gift from Paul. Priscilla, direct gift from Paul. And Apollo, a releasing of Priscilla and Aquila's anointing directly from Paul. So isn't that interesting? So she could have been a scribe of one of the books. But either way, what she carried in her heart is what Paul carried in his heart. So he gave them great trust and he gave them much profile. And he says in uh, Romans 16, Greet Pr uh, Priscilla and Aquila who work with me in Christ Jesus and 
have risked their own necks for my life. I am grateful to them. And so are all the churches among the Gentiles. Greet also the church that is in their house. Greet my dear friend Acoponius, who has the first who was the first convert to Christ in Asia. So he gives great recognition to Priscilla and Aquila. They always mention together, which means that they're gifting and complemented each other. But six out of the uh, four out of the six times, Priscilla is seen as the primary gift. She was the teacher, she was the equipper, and she was the one that was operating under the mantle of a teacher. Okay. In Romans 16, verse 6, it says, Greet Mary, who has worked very hard for you. And then in verse 7, it says, Greet Andronicus and Junior, my fellow Jews, who are in prison with me. So he was in prison writing the letter, and they were there with him, and are promoted among the, pro the apostles, and they were also in Christ before me. Now, what I want you to understand, friends, is that Andronicus is a man and Junia is a woman. That was her Latin name. The description um, in the Thayer and the Strongs calls her a Christian woman at Rome. She has uh, she was viewed as both a woman and an apostle. And it was Giles in the 13th century that tried to say, no, maybe she was a man. Because by then they were trying to demote women again. Women had had such freedom in the church and they were trying to demote. So he started writing and saying, maybe she was a man. But up until that period of time, the 13th century, everybody had called and said it was a woman. And what's more, she was an apostle. And she got born again, spirit-filled, and was in ministry before Paul. Now, what I want you to understand is this. Paul, people often say Paul changed his name after his conversion. That's not actually true. Paul's name was Saul. That was his Hebrew name. But his Latin name was Paul. Remember, he was a Roman citizen. So he would have had a, a name that could be understood by the Romans, but he had a name that was understood by the Hebrew. And so their names it had a similar sound. The one was Paul. So among the Gentiles, he was Paul. But among the Hebrew, he was Saul. Now, we do exactly the same thing. If I had to say that, um, that I met John, but I was talking to an Afrikaans community, the chances are to let them understand who I'm talking about, I would say Johan. Because Johan is the, the Afrikaans version to John. And so we do that ourselves with different names we will use it in a slightly different context depending on who we're speaking to and what language we're speaking in or you might find an afrikaans person calling their son johan but then later on he becomes more of an english community and they might change it to john or there are many names that get changed um, because of the different community and and, and uh, pronouncing it differently now that's what happened with paul among the hebrews he was saul and among the greeks he was paul his Latin name was Paul. His Hebrew name was Saul. Now, they say the same thing happened of Junia. Now, if we look back at the women that were being trained with Jesus, remember Saul, Paul got born again three years after Jesus died. So this woman, Paul said, was already serving God before me. So she was part of Jesus's ministry. Now, if we look back at the women that were part of Jesus's ministry and we look back and to Luke, um, to Luke 8, verse 1 to 3, it says, there were the 12 of them and certain women, Mary called Magdalene, now we know he's already ministered through Mary about the resurrection, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward. Now, Junia was a woman from Rome. He was She was in, in prison with them in Rome, so we know that she was from Rome, and Herod lived in Rome, and this woman, Joanna, her husband worked for Herod. And many believe that Joanna was her Hebrew name, and Juna was her Latin name. Junia was her Latin name, Joanna was her Hebrew name. Now, if that was the case, and many do believe that that is what happened, and that is why she had profile with Jesus, she was trained with the apostles, she was recognized for her gifting, and then she was imprisoned with Paul, and Paul says that her and this other man are apostles, and they've been saved much longer than me, and we're all in prison together. So she was bearing the same suffering as Paul was because of her stand for Jesus Christ. So he worked for Herod of, of Antipas, and she, she herself was a disciple, 
And um, here it was trained by Jesus himself, equipped by Jesus, recognized for her gift. And later on, Paul gives recognition to her and says, this woman has been an apostle and this man, and they've been going much longer than me. And now we're suffering in prison together. And so we see the recognition of a woman apostle by Paul. Why am I bringing this to your attention, friends? Because Paul didn't disqualify women. And if we read those two passages of scripture out of context, we'll think he did, but he did not. Because he said woman free, he said Gentile woman free to serve Jesus. And Jesus said Jewish woman free to be all that they were created to be. And then in Romans 6 verse 8, it talks about another gentleman and a few very, very complicated names. And then we see in Romans 6 verse 12, it says, Greet Trifina and Trifosa who labored and worked hard in the Lord. Greet the beloved Persis, who also labored much in the Lord. So you have three women. He says, guys, greet them. They've really worked hard. They've done amazing things for God. He doesn't tell us exactly what area they worked in, but the fact that they gave their lives to serve Jesus. Greet them and send them, send them regards from me. And then there's greet uh, Rufus and greet a whole lot of other men. And then in verse 15, he says, greet Philologos and Julia, Neros and his sister, and Olympus, all these saints, and all the saints that are with them. And once again, he highlights Julia and the sister of Neros, and he says, greet them. He draws attention to these women that have worked so hard for Jesus. And so He's acknowledging that women have worked for God. He's acknowledging what they've done. He's acknowledged that they've got different levels of authority and different levels of gifting. He's acknowledging Priscilla, the, the, the teacher, fivefold teacher. She operated in a fivefold teacher call. He's acknowledged um, Junior, the apostle call. He acknowledged Phoebe, the deacon. Um, so he's acknowledged all these different people. He acknowledged Lydia, the pastor of a church, a businesswoman who pastored a church. And then um, it ends off in, in Romans 16, 16, it says, greet one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ greet you. So we see that Paul wrote two letters to two churches that were absolutely birthed in pagan worship in the most evil, terrible worship of the time. And he had to bring a whole new mindset to them. It's very interesting that the princess Diana who is the goddess of the wild animals, the moon, the fertility, and the underworld, is the neo-pagan goddess of the new of the new world of the new age that they call the wicker worship. So they built the whole wicker worship straight from Diana. And you know what's amazing for me, friends, as we're going into more of this liberal thinking and more paganism and more perversion and more freedom and sexuality and all the lusting after the flesh. And all the false religion and worshipping false gods and, and just this whole perversion that the world is trying to put on us. The books of Corinthians and Ephesians become much more powerful because we are faced with so many of the same things that they were faced with. And Paul said, it's really important for women to learn in a reverent way. Your husbands have been equipped. They've been trained. They've been taught from when they were very little. You have been released to be equipped and to be trained. And women, we want you to learn and we want you to have the same insight. But don't argue publicly. Don't shout publicly. Don't cut across a meeting. Have reverence for what's happening there. Don't make a noise. I think there's nothing harder than for somebody to be preaching their heart out and to have all kinds of chaos and no reverence going on. And it still happens today. You can go to many of the places that are used to their pagan temples. And they will have no understanding of just receiving and hearing and coming into presence and worshipping in a way that is spirit to spirit instead of being flesh to flesh. And they've all got to be trained in the same way. So we're not very different today than we were then, friends. He wasn't silencing women in ministry. He was silencing women that were immature and hadn't learned the truth of the way to be reverent in a church meeting. And that's why he says to the Ephesians church, submit to one another, honor one another, 
Wives, submit to your husbands. That's the head of the home. As Christ is the head of the church. Lay down his life. It's not about domination. It's about laying down your life. Learn from your husbands. Let them equip you. Let them teach you until you are able to flow in the fullness of what you've been called to do. And then the next one that I want to mention is John. Now, John was the, the, um, the cousin of Jesus. And we know that he was the beloved disciple of Jesus. And we know that he um, was also the disciple that um, that was on Patmos. And he had those incredible encounters with Jesus. And then later on, after Patmos, he became the pastor, the elect, the, the elder of the church in Ephesus. So we see that, that um, Paul started it. He established Ephesus. He handed it over to Timothy for a while. Timothy went there. He raised up elders. He brought in all the governance of the kingdom of heaven into the church. And later, after, two, uh, after 95 AD, John went and was the elder of the church of Ephesus. And he was there until the day that he died. And so he continued in that place to bring in the godly order of the church of Ephesus. Now, in 2 John, we see 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John, and they were all written um, just before John went on to, the, on to Patmos, they think. That's how they sort of time it out. And we see in 2 John that he says the elder, which is him, he's an elder, and he says, um, sorry, in 3 John, he says, to, the, to my dear friend Gaius, G-A-R-U-S, whom I love in truth, Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may be well with you even as your soul is getting along. And then he writes him a message of how to be able to lead people into deeper truth and faithfulness. So he starts a letter or from the elder to my dear friend. Now if we look at the letter 2, he says this, from the elder the same, to the chosen lady and her children, whom I love in truth and not I only, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth which lives in us and will be with us forever. And then he writes to her about, don't forget, you're doing such an amazing job, you're embracing people, you're doing such an amazing job, but don't forget to continue teaching about loving one another. So both of those are messages to people that are heading up churches, that are training people and equipping people, and he's training them and helping them with things that were difficult in their situation. Now, it says in, in 2 John 1 verse 1, the elect lady. Now, that means the chosen and the word courier, which is the word for lady, means a Christian woman to whom the second ep epistle of John was written. And so the, the history books and the research books tell us that he wrote to a woman. Children means the offspring, the children of God, the pupils, the disciples, those that are being taught. So he says to this woman, to the, you and to the people that you are teaching, once again, recognizing a woman's gift in teaching. Remember the Old Testament said that a woman cannot teach the Torah. A woman cannot teach doctrine. In the New Testament, Jesus said, I'm setting women free to be able to teach, to hear my word, and to bring the divine word of God. Priscilla was known as a woman that taught, and now this woman, and he doesn't give us her name, is known as a woman that taught, that had disciples. It says, um, to the elder, the elect lady, and her children whom I love, and not only, and not I only, but also all that have known the truth. And so she brought the doctrine of truth. To the people. So friends, we see how Jesus set women free. We see how he liberated them and moved them from being second grade to being exactly the same. He took them right back to that which was created in Genesis. There was no area that a woman wasn't allowed to be part of Jesus' ministry. The first message was brought to a woman. The the um, a prophetic word was brought by a woman. A woman anointed him. He looked women in the eye and spoke to them and equipped them and trained them. He allowed women to sit at his feet and equip and train them. And he he's resurrected Christ. The first time he, after his resurrection, he presented himself to a woman. Jesus completely allowed the gospel of his arriving on this earth to be ushered in, to be brought through, 
and to be seen through women and not through the men that were considered to be the experts of the time. They couldn't receive him. They wouldn't receive him. So he came to set women free. Now, I want to say this. It was never to make women superior to men. It was never for women to ever violate the headship of a man. But it was for women to take hold of the fullness of their gifting and be all that they were created to be. Now, the second part of this question was about um, 1 Corinthians 11. And if we read from 1 to 34, we'll see there's a whole lot talking about a head covering and about husbands and about a woman presenting herself well. And if we go back to the fact that Paul was addressing the fact that women, that the, there was chaos in the church, that there wasn't order, there was disorder, and he was presenting the, 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 the way that they were eating, it goes on further, and it talks about the breaking of bread, and it talks about having ought against each other, and it talks about division. But here he talks about the fact that a woman needed to present herself as being under her covering and on her head. So it says, now I want you to realize that the head of every woman is Christ. And the head of every man is Christ. And the head of the woman is man. And the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. The pagan priests used to cover their head and pray. And he's saying, you don't have to do that because the head is Christ. And you don't have to cover yourself for Christ. You stand transparent before Christ. And every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. Friends, he's just said the head is the man. He's not talking about her head. He's talking about the head of the partnership, the man. He's saying, woman, don't uncover your men. In the way that you pray, in the way that you prophesy, don't uncover them. Don't dis disrespect them. Don't do it like the pagans do. You need to honor your man. He's your protector. He's the one that's protecting you. He's the one that's empowering you. He's the one that's allowing you to move into your freedom. Be careful that in the way that you present yourself and you present the word of God, that you don't dishonor your head. Um, and every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It's not talking about this head. It's talking about uncovering her husband. It is just as though her head was shaven. It was a disgrace for a woman to shave her hair. And it says, if you are doing something that uncovers your husband, it's as if you're walking around with a shaved head. If a woman does not cover her head, she would have her hair cut off. And it would be a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut off or, sh or shaved. And she should cover her head, which means... Protect your husband. Make sure that you do it in a way that your husband is respected. What is the commission on a woman? Woman, respect your husbands. What is the commission on a man? Man, love your wives. Show him respect. Show him honor. Show him honor in a public place. When you come and present what God has got for you, respect him in the way that you do it. And that's what he was talking about. A man ought not to cover his head since he's in the image and the glory of God and the woman is in the glory of the man. For a man did not come from woman, but woman from man. Neither was a man created for woman, but woman for man. For this reason, and because of the angels, a woman ought to have a sign of authority on her head. Now, what does that mean, friends? The very headship, the very, the very submitting to your husband as the head means that he is the one that provides, he's the one that promotes, and he's the one that protects. So by submitting to the authority of a husband, remember it's not the domination. It's the fact that he carries authority. When the father gives his daughter away, he releases her out of the protection of his authority into the protection of her husband's authority. That husband is her protection in the spirit realm. The angels know that. The demons know that. So Jesus says, honor your husband and respect the authority that he carries to provide for you, to promote you, and to protect you. Do not be rebellious. Do not do something that's going to dishonor him. Do not be loud and boisterous and suggestive and sexual and sensual and behave like pagans because he's addressing paganism, friends. Be reverent. Respect your husband. Bring the word that God has got for you and let everybody know that you are the husband's glory, that you're reflecting your husband well. That's what it's talking about, friends. Um, it goes on to say, 
um, and that's the sign in your head. The sign is that you understand your husband carries authority in the spirit realm and you honoring that. In the Lord, however, women are not independent of men, nor is a man independent of a woman. So it's very clear you depend on each other, you submit to each other, but there is an authority, a protection that the spirit realm understands demons and angels that you are to, under, to, to, to recognize and to respect. For as a woman came from a man, so also a man is born of a woman. But everything comes from God. Judge for yourself. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? <clears throat> is it proper for a woman to pray in a manner that is uncovering her husband? Does not the very nature of things teach us that a man, if a man has long hair, it is a disgrace to him? And that if a woman has long hair, it's her glory. So he's saying, woman, <clears throat> your glory is your hair. The way you present yourself is a glory to your husband. The way that you bring things forth is a glory to your husband. Now, so many people use the scripture and say men are not allowed to have long hair. Well, if we remember, in those days, men walked around with their hair, yeah, that was called short hair. And women walked around with their hair down their back. That was called long hair. It's not talking about a cultural thing. It's talking about representing yourself in order. The other thing is that everybody wore robes. They tied them around them. They didn't have dresses. They didn't have pants. They didn't have the clothes we have today. <clears throat> so he was talking further on about being modestly dressed. In other words, not in a way that is sexual or sensual. Don't use your body to attract men the way that the pagans do. Dress in a way that's modest. So friends, how do we dress in a way that's modest? We don't use our body language or our clothes for sex appeal. We present ourselves in a way that brings glory to God and that brings glory to our husbands. So when it spoke about the covering, and then it goes on to talk about um, the, the breaking of bread and, and what I've spoken to you about before, the, 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 the way that they were just feasting and, and, and pushing people aside and eating, and it was all about paganistic values and ways. He says, honor your head, respect your head. Let them know that this is the man that protects you. Let them know in the way that you treat each other because you're not independent of each other, that there's something incredibly beautiful in this godly bond. Now, in the, in the New Testament days, the woman used a covering over the head and part of that was to, to symbolize that they were actually married, that I am married, I've covered my head. Often the young woman walked around without a covering and the prostitutes walked around without a covering. So the prostitutes would walk around just with their, with their flaunting their bodies and he says, just cover your head as a symbolism that you're married to this man. But he was talking metaphorically far more than what he was talking physically. <clears throat> because Wedding rings only started being used in about the 10th century from the Jews. So a Jewish woman didn't have a wedding ring <coughs> to show that they were married. They didn't change their surname to show that they were married. So the way that they demonstrated it was by wearing a covering over their head and then they would know this is a married woman. The surname exchange only happened in England from the 9th century. So it was only from the 9th and 10th century <coughs> excuse me, that there were other ways of representing yourself as a married woman. A married woman would have a ring. It's quite interesting because the Egyptians actually used a ring on their finger from about 400 um, uh, BC to represent their, their marriages. Because they believed that there was a vein that ran from this finger straight to the heart. And if they put a ring on that, then it meant that they had pledged themselves to each other and that that, that that blood vessel, that vein of love, would keep being bound because there was something holding it to stay in love. So that was why they did it. But it wasn't taken on as a method of, of modern um, marriage until about the 10th century. And it's only from the 10th century that a woman would be a wedding ring publicly, wherever, <clears throat> some people on the one hand, some people on the other hand, that would be a statement of I'm a married woman, and that a woman would take on her husband's surname to make a stand that I'm a married woman. So I think if Paul was writing today, and this is just my thoughts, that he would say, ladies, you married, present yourself as a married woman. 
You've got the name of your husband. Present yourself well. Bring glory to your husband in what you do. Don't usurp him. Don't embarrass him. Don't belittle him. Don't shout out and be rude the way the pagans do. Present yourself well. Let people look at you and come and compliment your husband. Because that's exactly what, what's meant to happen. Let him compliment your husband to say, you know what? You have an amazing wife. You've allowed her to flourish and to come into her wholeness and her fullness. And it's a compliment to you because you are her, his glory. That's what the word of God says. And so re represent yourself well for the man that you covenanted with. So that the angels will know and the spirit realm will know that you understand what godly authority is. But friends, that wasn't so that women had to hide in church. It wasn't so that women had to be quiet in church, and it definitely wasn't that women couldn't rise up in the fullness of their fivefold ministry, Ephesians 4, of their Holy Spirit giftings, 1 Corinthians 12, or of their personality traits that God gives in Romans 12. Jesus came to set us free, friends. The enemy caused women not only just to be dominated by a husband, but men dominating women. Jesus says, that's not what I created a woman like. He set the Jewish woman free. Paul came and he set the, the, the Corinthians and the, if, uh, the, the Latin woman free. And Jesus has set us free to be all that he's called us to be. Represent your husband well because he's your protection. And be all that God created you to be. And if you don't have a husband, then your next protection is the leaders in your church. They're there to protect you, friends, to promote you and to give you a good foundation. I really trust that this has been helpful. I trust that you've learned much and I trust that you will be able to walk in a new freedom as you understand the liberty. Jesus came to destroy the works of the evil one. Jesus took the curse upon himself and Jesus has set you free. And there's no reason that we cannot be who God called us to be. God bless you. I really trust this has been helpful. And until we chat again, good night.